The accused kidnappers were an odd couple. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're looking at 20 of the most evil couples in history. The level of evilness with both these people is so extreme. For this list, we're looking at notorious couples throughout history that participated in violence and spread fear. Which of these stories do you find the most disturbing? Let us know in the comments below. David and Catherine Burney. This couple from Perth, Australia, participated in what are known locally as the Morehouse murders. David and Catherine Burney are without a doubt the most violent couple in Australia's history. Throughout October and November of 1986, David and Catherine Burney kidnapped five women and took them to their namesake home on Morehouse Street. Of the five women, four were killed. Their final victim, Kate Moyer, managed to escape and contacted the authorities, who finally brought the Bernie's heinous spree to an end. She finds an unlocked window, scrambles through it, and half naked, she runs for help to the nearby shop. Both were given life sentences, and David Bernie passed away in prison in October of 2005. There was no sympathy at all for Bernie, who was, had been a, a predator on innocent people. David Parker Ray and Cindy Hendy. David Parker Ray is more famously known as the Toy Box Killer. The Toy Box was the name given to Ray's soundproof semi-trailer, which is where he would take his kidnapped victims. I'm sure that it goes without saying that you will not be given any opportunity to escape. Ray would hold them there for several months and do unspeakable things. It was never proven that Ray committed homicide, but he is suspected of killing up to 60 women. Ray talked about burying bodies, but he wasn't a convicted killer. Ray was aided by a girlfriend named Cindy Hendy, whom he met at a state park. Hendy helped Ray pick and kidnap his victims and would occasionally participate further. Hendy was eventually sentenced to over 30 years in prison, but was released in early 2019. Ray died of a heart attack in 2002. Ray died in prison in 2002 and took his evil secrets with him. Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb. These two University of Chicago students wished to prove their incredible intelligence and commit the perfect crime. So they decided to kidnap and kill one Bobby Franks. Franks was actually related to Loeb, being his second cousin. They enacted their plan on May 21st, 1924, grabbing Franks and killing him. On May 22nd, 1924, just hours after the body of Bobby Franks was found, the hunt for his killers got underway. Despite planning for seven months, their supposedly perfect crime fell apart almost instantly, and they confessed just a week later. Richard confessed and then gave Crow details that only the murderers could have known. While the nature of their relationship is somewhat ambiguous, it is strongly suggested that Leopold and Loeb shared at least a brief sexual relationship. There was an arrangement that Richard would agree to have sex with Nathan if Nathan accompanied Richard when he did his crime. Alton Coleman and Deborah Brown. In 1983, Deborah Brown was engaged to be married when she met a criminal named Alton Coleman. They quickly developed a relationship and Brown left her fiance to be with Coleman. Coleman was facing a criminal trial relating to a previous crime when he and Brown fled Illinois to Wisconsin. He saw the approaching officer and took off. There, they killed the young Vernita Wheat. This began a killing spree that spread throughout the American Midwest. They were eventually caught and arrested on July 20th, 1984, having killed a total of eight people. With surprising ease, they were able to corner Coleman. Both were sentenced to death, but Brown was later spared and given life in prison. Coleman was executed by lethal injection on April 26, 2002. Cameron and Janice Hooker. 20-year-old Colleen Stan was hitchhiking in Northern California when she was picked up by a friendly-looking family consisting of Cameron and Janice Hooker and their young baby. But shortly after, Stan was violently kidnapped and taken to the couple's home. She was imprisoned by the Hookers for the next seven years. That ride turned into a decade of torture, slavery, and terror. When she wasn't being subjected to Cameron's violent demands, Stan was kept locked inside a small wooden box. I did think I was going to die. <laughs> I was terribly claustrophobic. Janice eventually grew disillusioned with the whole ordeal and betrayed her husband by going to the police. She was given full immunity in exchange for testifying against Cameron, and he was given life in prison. His wife was never prosecuted because she helped Colleen escape and also agreed to testify against her husband. Gwendolyn Graham and Kathy Wood. 
This couple worked as nurses' aides in Michigan's Alpine Manor nursing home. Beginning in January of 1987, the two conspired to kill elderly patients suffering from Alzheimer's. For the next few months, both Graham and Wood took the lives of five nursing home residents. Wood cooperated with police, telling them that Graham suffocated the women with washcloths while she was the lookout. Graham later began dating another nurse at the facility and moved with her to Texas, effectively ending the crime spree. However, Wood told her ex-husband about the crimes, and he in turn informed the authorities. Wood portrayed herself as a victim during the resulting trial, but it's now believed that she masterminded the whole enterprise to exact revenge against Graham, who had begun dating another woman. It worked, and Graham was given life in prison. I thought that Gwen was the first person to ever love me. Pearl Fernandez and Isauro Aguirre. Pearl Fernandez had a son with Arnold Contreras, whom they named Gabriel. She eventually met security guard Isauro Aguirre, and the two gained custody of young Gabriel. However, Fernandez's family expressed hesitation and worry about this agreement. Over the next eight months, Gabriel was subjected to some horrific forms of physical and mental abuse. On May 22, 2013, Gabriel was brutally beaten. When he stopped breathing, Fernandez called 911 and her son was rushed to the hospital. Tragically, Gabriel never recovered from his injuries, and he died two days later. Fernandez was given life in prison, and Aguirre was sentenced to death. I wish you were alive. Every day, I, I wish I made Carol M. Bundy and Doug Clark. These two met at a bar in 1980 and quickly developed a relationship. She instantly became infatuated with a man named Doug Clark. It wasn't long before Clark moved in with Bundy and embarked on his now infamous killing spree that would leave multiple people dead. While the two would later be known as the Sunset Strip Killers, the killings themselves were mostly committed by Clark. Two months later, Doug told Carol he killed the two runaways. The homicides troubled Bundy, but she nevertheless remained an accomplice, refusing to give up Clark. Bundy eventually told her ex-lover Jack Murray about the crimes, but she killed him to ensure his silence. However, the crime spree troubled Bundy so much that she eventually confessed to the authorities, and she and Clark were both arrested. She tells them that she and Doug are the serial killers they have been looking for. Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole. The names Henry Lee Lucas and Otis Toole are well known. For a time, it was believed that Lucas had killed over 600 people, making him the most prolific killer in American history. Lucas bragged to police that he killed more than 600 men, women, and children. Toole claimed 125 victims. However, it was later found that these confessions were fabricated so that Lucas could enjoy rewards in prison. Lucas and Toole likely developed a sexual relationship after meeting in 1976, and the extent of their crimes remains ambiguous. They met at a soup kitchen in Jacksonville, soon became lovers, and moved in together at Toole's mother's house. Lucas was confirmed to have killed two people in 1983, and eight other victims remain disputed. Toole is widely suspected of having killed the young Adam Walsh in 1981. The nature of their crimes may forever remain uncertain. But they nevertheless conspired to fool the authorities and wasted precious time and resources in the process. He died in prison on September 15, 1996. Ray and Faye Copeland. From 1986 to 1989, Ray and Faye Copeland conspired to kill five men, although their victim count may be as high as 12. They appeared to be just an elderly farm couple that were uh, kind of shy and and didn't mix much with the people. The Copelands ran a farm in Mooresville, Missouri, but Ray was a proven fraud, so local providers refused to sell him cattle. To get around this, Copeland devised a scam. He would pick up drifters, write them fraudulent checks, and have them buy the cattle for him. There were eight men wanted for writing bad checks to cattle auction houses in central Missouri. All had disappeared from the area without a trace. He would then sell the cattle for a profit before the checks bounced and kill the drifter who bought it to ensure their silence. Despite the efforts of her defense team, Faye was found to be a knowing accomplice to her husband, and both were sentenced to death. Ray Copeland was convicted of five counts of murder and sentenced to death. Charles Starkweather and Carol Ann Fugate. These two met in 1956, when Starkweather was 18 and Fugate 13. Starkweather quickly grew attached to Fugate and dropped out of high school to be closer to her. 
The two eventually began a relationship, and Starkweather killed Fugate's mother, stepfather, and sister on January 21st, 1958. I think he got in an argument uh, over Carol with uh, Mr. Bartlett, and I think it just escalated from there. They were Starkweather's second, third, and fourth victims, as he had killed a gas station attendant the previous November. Starkweather and Fugate then embarked on a crime spree throughout Nebraska and Wyoming that left a further seven people dead. In the space of less than two months, 11 innocent people had died in a killing spree that sent shockwaves around the United States. Fugate claimed that she never personally took a life, but Starkweather said otherwise. Regardless, Starkweather was executed for his crimes, and Fugate was released from prison in 1976 after spending 17 years behind bars. Until they had been stopped, they would have kept going. There was nothing behind. They had no remorse. They had no reason. Fred and Rose West. The horrific crime spree of Fred and Rose West lasted throughout much of the 70s and 80s. By the time they were finally arrested in the 90s, the couple had killed at least 10 people. The Wests would kill their victims inside their Gloucester house and bury their remains in the basement and yard. 25 Cromwell Street was the burial ground for nine young women. Fred was the more prolific killer of the two, having killed at least two people without the involvement of his wife. His personal body count may exceed 13. Fred and Rose West appeared at Gloucester Magistrates Court, jointly charged with nine murders. Rose helped kill nine women with her husband, in addition to her stepdaughter, whom Fred had from a prior marriage. Their Gloucester home later became known as the House of Horrors. Philip and Nancy Garrido. On the morning of June 10, 1991, J.C. Dugard was kidnapped. She remained missing for the next 18 years. It was later proven that Dugard was abducted by Philip and Nancy Garrido and held captive on the property of their Antioch, California home. Dugard was routinely mistreated by Philip and eventually gave birth to two daughters. I thought, oh, somebody's looking for directions. On August 24, 2009, Philip visited the campus of the University of California, Berkeley with his and Dugard's daughters. An employee took notice of the girl's suspicious behavior, so she notified Officer Allie Jacobs. And the result was that we found JC 18 years later with her daughters alive. Jacobs helped uncover the truth of the girl's identities, and Dugard was finally found after nearly two decades. She was in good health, uh, but living in a backyard for the past 18 years does take its toll. Inessa Tarvierdieva and Raman Potkapayev. Hailing from Stavropol, Russia, Inessa Tarvierdieva and Raman Potkapayev were part of the gang of Amazons. This serial killing family also consisted of the couple's two children, Victoria and Anastasia. The entire family was supposedly aided by Potkapayev's sister and her husband, a law enforcement officer who fed the family inside information. Between 2007 and 2013, the gang of Amazons embarked on a massive crime spree that left dozens dead. The victims included a lieutenant colonel and his family and a patrol officer who pulled over Potkapayev and Victoria. However, it was this confrontation that proved their downfall. Potkapayev was killed by responding officers, and the rest of his family was rounded up and arrested. Rizwan Farouk and Tashfin Malik Both Rizwan Farouk and Tashfin Malik had promising careers ahead of them. Farouk earned a bachelor's degree in environmental health, and Malik studied pharmacology in Pakistan. She studied to be a pharmacist and received a degree in 2012. The two met each other over the internet and quickly married, with Malik moving to California to be with Farouk. The very next year, the newly married couple committed an attack on the Inland Regional Center in San Bernardino, which was hosting the Department of Public Health's Christmas party. At 11 a.m., the couple entered the conference room wearing tactical vests and armed with rifles. Both opened fire just before 11 a.m. and killed a total of 14 people. A further 22 were badly injured. Both Farouk and Malik were later killed in a shootout with the police. And the question for investigators right now, where were they going and what, if anything, were they plotting next? Alvin and Judith Neely. In 1980, 27-year-old Alvin Neely left his first wife and eloped with 16-year-old Judith Adams. Two years after their marriage, the Neelys kidnapped the young Lisa Milliken from a mall in Rome, Georgia. Milliken was subsequently taken to an Alabama motel and killed. Just a few days later, the Neelys did the same thing to Janice Chapman after shooting her fiancé John Hancock. 
However, Hancock survived and reported the Neelys to the authorities. The next day, he was at the Rome police station sitting on a bench when he heard a recording of Judith Neely's voice. They were promptly arrested, and 18-year-old Judith Neely became the youngest American woman ever sentenced to death. However, this was later commuted to life in prison in 1999. You don't see those crimes around here. That's something that uh, you always hear about somewhere else, and, and it, was, uh, it was just uh, a tragedy. Gerald and Charlene Gallego. Gerald and Charlene Gallego killed 10 people from September 1978 to November 1980. Charlene Williams came from a supportive family, but her life fell into disrepair when she started using drugs. Things got even worse when she met and married a career criminal named Gerald Gallego. He thought he was God's gift to women. Their crime spree began on September 11, 1978, when they abducted two teenage girls. The Gallegos were caught abducting an engaged couple in November of 1980, and the police were promptly informed. College sweethearts Mary Beth and Craig would be Gerald and Charlene's final victims, as their abduction led to their arrest. This led to their arrests, and Gerald was sentenced to death. Charlene was given nearly 17 years in exchange for testifying against her husband. Charlene's testimony allowed the prosecution to secure the sentence they desired. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Known as the most evil woman in Britain, Myra Hindley embarked on a horrific crime spree with her boyfriend, Ian Brady. The crimes committed by Moore's murderer, Myra Hindley, shocked the nation. Between July 1963 and October 1965, Brady and Hindley killed five young persons and dumped at least some of their bodies in the Saddleworth Moor. It's because of this that their crime spree is now known as the Moore's murders. A case like this was unique. For the first time in British history, a woman had been implicated in a killing partnership. One of their victims buried at the moor was Leslie Ann Downey. The couple's dealings with Downey were captured on tape and in various photos, ensuring that Brady and Hindley became infamous public enemies in Britain. She's got the devil in it. She's the devil itself. Raymond Fernandez and Martha Beck. In 1947, a single mother of two named Martha Beck placed a personal ad in the newspaper, and it was answered by a man named Raymond Fernandez. Martha. Raymond. Beck developed an intense fascination with Fernandez and even sent her children away so she could devote herself to him. The two quickly fell into a routine of violence and killed at least three people in the late 40s. One was a 66-year-old woman named Janet Fay, and the other two were 28-year-old Delphine Downing and her daughter. Downing's neighbors alerted the police and the couple was arrested. Both were executed on the same day, March 8, 1951. Fernandez was 36 and Beck was 30. Oh my God. Oh my God. He kills for me. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. The most infamous couple in Canadian history, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka killed three young women throughout the early 90s. Their first victim was Homolka's younger sister, Tammy. Two days before Christmas in 1990, the couple severely mistreated her. Tammy Homolka then choked on her vomit and died. Tammy Homolka's unexpected death would not signal the end of Paul and Carla's deviant games. The couple then kidnapped Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French, only this time they intentionally killed the girls. After they were captured, Homolka conned the investigators and received a very favorable plea bargain in exchange for testifying against her husband. While Bernardo was sentenced to life, Homolka was freed on July 4, 2005. She has remained free ever since and even started a family. Ultimately, the deal Carla made with the prosecution would stand. She would serve just 12 years for her part in the crimes. Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.